ministry years ago, and somebody that I have absolute respect for, uh, Brother Sam and Victor Adeli, and so that's the water I drink from. And so because of that, I accord you all honor on their behalf as you come up to bless us in Jesus' name. Make him feel well. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, leaders. So it's great to be here. Um, I would say thank you for the opportunity, sir. And I think it's okay to appreciate the man of God for being able to um, start back there during the first session. I've said to Pastor Brent, I said, um, literally everything you said is something that especially young leaders and ministers need to hear. Because sometimes they get drunk on big stuff that really don't make sense. That's why they are titled for no impact. So, you know, um, it's, I appreciate I appreciate you allowing me to do this one, taking the risk to say the things you said. Um, it's been a great time. It's been a great time. I'm going to know that sometimes it is not even what we say that matters as much as the atmosphere that we do along that. And that's one of the things I've come to realize when it comes to probably church or ministry or encountering God. Sometimes when we say, oh, the presence of God, we're talking about a place where God makes himself feel welcome. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You, you, I mean, thank God we have some, we have a couple of Obas allow me to use that word here. Mm -hmm. They understand protocol like some of us don't understand because mm -hmm. when you show up at a palace or when you meet at all, you, you don't go to them and pat them on the back. You know, there are protocols. And I've been in worship here for a few years. I realized that God's presence is everywhere, but God is not acting everywhere. And if you're going to get God to be active in a place, because you know, we say, oh, God, God is there, God, is, God wasn't there. No, God is everywhere, even in hell. It's just that His presence is not known everywhere. So, in order to get His presence to be active everywhere, there's something called, we need to observe protocol. And, and I want to say is I'm going to get out of our faith. You know, this generation, we are very spoiled sometimes, and we don't have respect, because most of our people are coming from a home where we've not been taught respect. So during praise and worship, we're going to say to God that we are busy texting or Facebooking, but we expect God to move. But I come to realize it's not the number of songs you sing. If you give God quality attention and respect for a minute, what can happen within that one minute can change your life forever. I'm not here to preach. <laughs> but this, this is what I would love to do for probably two minutes. Um, because it's not in the gift of sin, and it's not in the sweetness of song, it's in the sincerity of the heart. And I'm talking about worship. None of us here loves a passive, cheating lover. We want someone who is absolutely dedicated to us, someone who gives us their absolute, total, complete self. Can you just actually just get up on your feet and just, just focus on the Lord? And just, just love on Him. You don't have to be gifted with the gift of the ability to serve. But whatever it is that you got, good gift, you just, just love them. We're worshiping through songs. Just, just love them. Let's go pass on. Thank you for providing for me. Yes, he is our provision, but he is more than all of that. Thank you, Jesus. There's a song that says, You are the Lord.
one word sometimes, so that's all we need to sing here. God will feel comfortable and manifest his presence. And he said, Hallelujah. I'm going to sing it right now. Say, Uh, we know that uh, there will be a lot of gifts 
house. Uh, a lot of things are wrong with us, yes. But the Lord, you are towards the end time, uh, uh, you have uh, that there are not particular desire, that there is a more excellent way to do ministry, to serve him, that you will begin to run down. In the first session, I've seen that, and we've asked certain things. And I believe going to the second session, that uh, God is seeking to be revealing unto us more excellent ways, amen, to walk with him, to do his work. Uh, uh, as the end time comes in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, in the book of Zechariah chapter 1, verse 17, uh, the Bible says, My kingdom um, through prosperity child is spread out God. Um, I got it today, we thank God. Uh, like um, my father and brother said earlier on the program, this is Aya, um, and that is what uh, most ministries or Christian bodies are facing in the United Kingdom. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's important that in, uh, in occasions like this, that uh, we collect offering. Praise the Lord. No, not because um, it's going to eat it or because we're going to share it, but because at least we need to advance the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Uh, we want to get to uh, the point in this organization that uh, when we are holding a meeting like this, we are holding it in, in one of our buildings in our mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. From the day, my daughter is here, maybe. maybe uh, in, in the building of one of the churches that are under CMA, or maybe in the building of a particular businessman, I said, you know, I'm part of CMA, so come and do this. So, uh, one of the more reasons why we have to, like, we can buy it today without having a program like the, 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 uh, where we are last, uh, last program, we are now those at least to, uh, to have refreshments, those that they restricted the, the, this for now. We can't just bring so we can buy it. But if it was to be our own building, or a place where we, or if we are able to afford the place, where we could we might. So, more of that, that's what uh, the uh, thing that, that part of the thing that the offerings will be going towards. It's not as if God is going to eat it or God knows the money that he gave, and also use it to advance his kingdom. So, I believe that one of us will put our hands to our pockets and package qualitative offering. If we are able to give towards the work of God, praise the Lord. Offering time. How do you do that?
I met over the book Tom say, ah, I've got to talk, you know. <laughs> I met over the book Tom say over like three years ago. Uh, somebody that um, we have lots of history together in the past. But I honor his present position because sometimes people mix stuff together. And so I want you to welcome him, not as somebody I knew years back, but somebody that God has esteemed into this new position. I give to you all that good talk. Before there can be an end, there has to be a beginning. And I would like to quickly take us to where it all started. And I'll take you to John 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The building of the end time church started the very moment God decided to send his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to the world to die for our sins. That whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That period, I would say, was a period that God told the plan and the design of the end time church together. That was when he actually crafted it out by himself, for himself, for his own purpose. The very foundation of the end time church can then be said to have been done and completed when Jesus Christ came to this world, died, buried, and on the third day when he rose from the dead. So, for the last 2,000 years, or over the last 2,000 years, what we have been doing is simply placing one brick on the other to build that end time church. So, what am I saying? A lot of us can now ask, so why this conference? <laughs> Today, we have not come here to replan or to redesign it. But what we have come here to do is to review, to ask ourselves how far we have gone. Do we know the state of things we are in? Are we on the right path? If not, what amends do we need to make? How much more do we have left to do? What resources do we have to do what we need to accomplish? 
I'm talking about human and non-human resources. What are the other challenges in being able to move ahead? What is the specific duty of each and every person? Do we all have specific areas in terms of geographical location to operate for this assignment? These questions are endless. Because this topic is so vast. And I'm sure this is only one part of it. But what I'm hoping is that by the end of today, we will have a good understanding of where we are and what is expected of each and every one of us. I'll say something about this conference. I say it is timely and divine, and I'll tell you why. I have known Pastor Matthew, as I said, for over 30 years. He has never heard me speak about the scriptures, no. He does not know anything about what I do concerning the church. He doesn't have any inclination about it. The only time that he's heard me speak is the two minutes of grace I heard, I had, when he was celebrating his birthday in June. And then he invited me for this program. Both of us spoke about three days ago and I said something to him, but he didn't understand, but I didn't really tell him anything because I said, I thought by the time I finished speaking, he would have answers to certain questions he has. What am I trying to say? Over the last two years, but let me put it this way, when he told me the topic, I just smiled. Because I knew it was specifically or divinely instructed. And then even regarding the audience. Because over the last two years, I've been part of a group that have been speaking and meeting with denominational heads in Nigeria to speak about the unity of the church as regards every aspect of Nigeria. So, this conference just confirms that it is time for God's children in this part of the world to know and understand the next phase. Let us pray. My God and my Father, I thank and I bless you for this day and give you all the glory for making today possible. You, O oh Lord, are the creator of the heavens and the earth, and you, O oh Lord, are the one who reveals knowledge to and imparts wisdom on mankind. Lord, as we are gathered here, reveal to us that which we have not previously been privileged to understand. Amen. Guide us in these critical times, O Lord, Amen. that we may have divine understanding of our specific roles in your project. Amen. And let us be useful tools, O Lord, Amen. in your hands till the very end in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask four questions. And I'll try and answer each of them as we go now. The first one is, is there anything such as end time? Or, and what is the meaning of end time? The second one, is there any reason to build a church that will suit this period different from what we know as the church that is obtainable today.
today. The third, if the answer is yes, do we have the right or approval to do it? And the last one, what is the meaning of church? Or what is the meaning of this church? I'll tell you a little story. Some time ago, about 20 years actually, this was in Nigeria, when I was still involved in event management. I was traveling between Lagos and Ibadan. And it was the Christmas period. By the time I got to the toll gate, coming from the inside Lagos, there was heavy traffic. And the cars kept on moving slowly. It took me about an hour there. We had not gone up to a mile. I realized it was a bad accident. Several people injured. Two dead bodies <coughs> on the streets. Goods, items, scattered. And the first thing that I thought, you know, with a body in heart, I said, God, why this period? Especially the period when the world is about to celebrate the memory of the birth of Christ. Two things came to me. But I'll say the first one and then I'll say the second part later. It was very simple, but it was scary. And then, but the second part of that first one was very reassuring. The first thing that came was, does this happen or not? Don't you realize that these accidents and the loss of lives don't happen only in Nigeria. I thought, yes. Don't you realize that this is the time that the birth of Christ is being announced? Yes. Okay, what happened at the birth of Christ, around the birth of Christ? If you remember, as soon as Christ was born, King Herod started killing people. Killed children from two years and below. And what was revealed then was that as soon as the birth of Christ is being announced all over the world, coming in, the King Herod of this world, is still going about looking for Christ to kill. So he keeps on killing people. When that happened, I thought, wow. But the reassuring part of it is that it is true Christ is coming back. But the scary part is the killing aspect. And I'll take you to the Bible. In Matthew 24, verse 36 to 37, just to understand what I'm saying. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And the second verse, in verse 37, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So Christ is coming back. Amen. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 10 to 14 also says the same thing. But give it several warnings. I can run down that or I can go through do you want to take note of it, or do you want me to quickly read it out? Okay, verse 10. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, 
and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. There are several warnings for us not to be left out because the end time period signifies the beginning of, right? Signifies the beginning of, or you can say it is ushering in the time that will become endless. Come on, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. You understand? <laughs> this end time that we're in now is ushering in the time that will become endless. And Timothy, Paul was warning when he wrote to Timothy. If you see, go to Timothy 3, verses 1 to 4. He said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, inconsistent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That is, that I will use at the end of my first question, and then I'll quickly go into the second one. The end time church, in literary terms, because I'll explain the meaning of church later, but the end time church, in literary terms, should definitely be different from what is obtainable today for two reasons. Pastor Matthew said earlier on, talking about anti-Christian stuff, but I'll say something. The church, or the Christian church, for Christianity, as practiced today by several doctrines, and unknowingly to them, right, is a hybrid of Greek mythology, Babylonian idolatry, Egyptian paganism, and African occultism. Yes, that is what we are practicing today as Christianity. So I want to go back to the second part of what the Christmas celebration. When the Christmas celebration or the Christmas day was that particular period was used to celebrate Christmas. It was derived from the practices of all these, you know, all these things that are obviously antichrist. And that period, every year, requires human sacrifices. So, that Christmas period that we're celebrating is used to spill blood in, as rituals for the 
whatever um, deity that um, they're trying to sacrifice to or worship or whatever. That's why as Christians, well, I'll explain something later. You will get, as I continue, you will understand that already when I say as Christian, in the literary meaning, as in one that understands and believes in Christ and has the blood of Christ over you, you have no issues, you have no reason to be afraid. But it can be scary. And that's why, and then the second one, Christianity. The second, the re second reason why the church of the end time needs to be different from the church of now. Is that Christianity, the church we have now, is of Christianity as a religion. And Christianity as a religion is a tool to deceive men. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because because of what? It lacks the power which is only available in righteousness and right standing with God. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it, it, speaks, it spells it out. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. So, seven chapters and verses in the New Testament were very emphatic on the grand deception, and Jesus Christ also warned that many would claim to be Him. And he kept on saying that also many would be deceived in this day. He didn't say a few, he said many. But one problem we have is once the name of Christ is called into a gathering, we tend to look away. We ignore all the obvious signs of deception. We embrace the religion. And we're guilty of something. Because the Bible tells us, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It didn't say they were nice people. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Not because they don't have knowledge, but because their teachers rejected that knowledge. Christianity, now going a bit deeper, is a way of life that should mirror the life of Christ and not a religion. It's not a religion at all. And when we live that way of life, we would have been able to understand the grace that abounds over us in becoming the sons of God because we have been cleansed with the blood of the Lamb that is the blood of Jesus Christ and as he said well you know a lot of times we use the word grace to excuse ourselves from so many things he said and he said he has come not to do away with anything with the laws but he has come that he may fulfill the laws. So what am I saying? I am saying that we also need to fulfill the laws with the grace of God. <laughs> I, I, uh, Matthew 5, 17 to 20 says it all. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle 
shall in no wise pass from the law till all will be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we have to take a position, we have to make a choice. Do we want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Do we want to be great on earth? Or do we want to be least on earth and be great in the kingdom of heaven? You know, uh, something, when I was thinking and meditating about this conference, something came to me, I was like, why do we really observe the communion, the giving of the bread and wine? And we do it so religiously. Is it because Christ said we should do it in remembrance of him? Don't get me wrong, I am not discounted anything it, and I am not discarding of it. I am trying to compare something. What of that, I'm trying to compare with this, what of that which God said we should observe forever and as a sign between Him and ourselves, which is the Sabbath day? Let me quickly read to you Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work there, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Christ said he had come to fulfill the laws and that every word will come to pass. In building the true end time church, we need to revisit the Sabbath day. Yes, it is observed as Sunday, but is it Sunday? What is the true meaning of Sunday? The day we worship, that they used to worship the sun. Which is the Sabbath day? I'm going to move on to the third question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remind you of that particular question. It says, if the answer is yes, do we have the right approval to do it? That is to build that church. Um, one more minute. Okay. 
whenever we set out to doing God's work, the accuser comes to challenge. <coughs> it challenges you because the accuser also challenged Christ. If truly you are the Son of God, why not throw yourself down? Isn't it written that he would command his angels to lift you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone? I'll tell you one little story. I was installed in the church. It was Christian church priest that installed me according to the scriptures. But immediately after that installation, some people stopped going to the church. Some people also saw it as an opportunity that those that don't accept my faith saw it as an opportunity to create problems. They went to court. Yeah, they went to court, even though they knew they had no right standing to even think they can be on the throne. But they brought one of them, they came up with fabricated stories, came up with everything possible. And they went to court. The case lasted over six years. Wow. <laughs> but towards the end of these six years, I'm talking of actually December last year, something happened. Okay, no. Sometime in June, July, my lawyer told me I had been taken out of the case, that I had really nothing to answer. But one way or the other, sometime in November, some people came back saying that it, it appears judgment was going to be delivered. My lawyer was called and we told him this was going on. He got a bit confused that the case, I should have been taken out of the case long before this. And he believed that the case would have been disposed of, but that wasn't the case. He now felt maybe there were other forces trying to push the judge to deliver a judgment through the back door. So he now told me this was what he was going to do that he was going to move the motion when the judge was about to deliver the judgment to stop her from, deliver, from delivering the judgment and re-enter me into the case so that I can now have witnesses and then we can go for a full-blown trial. Anyway, the day the judgment was going to be delivered, there was a public holiday, so the date was moved. And this particular day, on a Sunday, the Saturday, there was a, a service on Friday night into Saturday, and then that Saturday morning, straight from Lagos, I went straight to Ethiopia in Ocean State. And I made this declaration that um, I took over and said, God, if I have to appear once in that courtroom, then my testimony will be incomplete, even if I win the case. Exactly six days after that, I was not there. I don't even think my lawyer was in court. The judgment was delivered. I got two or three calls. The case had been dismissed. I do not know the judge. I never saw the judge once. I never moved near the premises of the court. Not once. So this is what I'm trying to explain. The accuser would always come once you set out to do God's work. But your responsibility or our responsibility as children of God is to stand on the word of God. Yeah. 
Pastor Matthew was saying earlier on about the seven seven pillars in the society. A lot of times I hear people say, what has religion got to do with it? What has religion got to do with governance? Well, it is because they practice religion, we have a way of life. But then, if religion is what they understand, I would use that. And I tell them, what has the religion got to do with it? Number one, it is the same governance that brings about policies that are contrary to our values, which is the very basis of our faith. So, and these promises, they do only one thing, they question our faith. Yes. Part of the work I did there, when we're talking about church unity, and part of what I, had, I got when, and the reason why I went to do, or get installed in the church, was that I understood something that the government in Africa, or the state of Africa, in its current situation of poverty and everything down, will never be resolved until the church starts installing the government. Mm. That is the number one responsibility of the church. And I'll, and, uh, I'll what's it called? Confirm it from the Bible. If you go to Revelation 5, verse 10, it says, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign in on the earth, not in heaven on the earth. You remember the teachers said your reward is in heaven, so they paid them low. <laughs> <laughs> but now, they're getting wiser. So they don't want their reward in heaven anymore. They want it here on earth. So they're demanding for more pay. <laughs> so even then, they are also getting wiser. Let me say something about this. And this is something that is very, very painful. Every day, we hear the promoters of Islam condemning constituted laws as man-made, saying they will take over the world on behalf of their Prophet Muhammad for their, for their Allah. What are those that are called by his name doing? In many parts of the world, the persecution of the children of God are brothers and sisters, has increased like never before, with the most horrific and unimaginable violence and massacre unleashed on them. And these are defense, defenseless and weak people. The slaughtering of women and children has reached heights that can only be compared with the genocide. Yet, we who are children of faith continuously criticize and pull one another down. We take advantage of those who are broken in spirit for physical riches for ourselves. To display a false sense of security and achievement to give
give false